just to the north of us, a prolific writer and a well-regarded commentator on religious issues in the public square. We on the OSS Lecture Memorial Series uh, Committee are proud that at, over the past 30 years or so, we have brought to the seminary community a wide variety of speakers from across the political and ecumenical spectrum. We have ranged widely in our choices from Christian leaders, well-known scholars, and charismatic speakers. Sometimes they're the same person. <laughs> <coughs> From within the Lutheran House to faithful Christian brothers and sisters from the Ecumenical Church. So I can announce today with pleasure that next year our speaker will be the Education and Youth Professor from Princeton Seminary, Kenda Creasy Dean, one of the more highly regarded thinkers on how to evangelize and educate our youth, a burning concern for all of us today. For the OSS Committee, several of us who were shaped and formed by George OSS's passion for evangelism, our only requirement is that the speaker have an evangelical passion to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. Dr. Boyd is well known for just that passion. His many appearances in a wide variety of venues have shown most clearly his deep love of what we in the theological community call apologetics. That is, engaging in conversation about the faith with those that we might call second or third generations of the cultured despisers, cultural despisers of the faith, who have not really been engaged by the Christian faith or maybe know very little about it, except that it's unattractive, legalistic, and unappealing. His book, Letters from a Skeptic, perhaps his most personal and moving introduces us to just such a conversation he had with his own father, who had confessed himself to be an agnostic, even an atheist, but who, after these conversations throughout their lives, surrendered himself to Jesus before his recent death. Greg, your presence here among us has been bracing and a challenge. And we look forward now to your second lecture on advancing the cruciform revolution a Kingdom Perspective on Evangelism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Boyd. Thanks so much, appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's, uh, as I said yesterday, a real honor to be here. I'm uh, really enjoying myself. And I, I deeply respect the uh, desire that the OSC Committee has for presenting a diversity of perspectives um, uh, just looking at the list of speakers in the past, you see a really interesting uh, dose of diversity there, and that's a, a good thing for any educational institution. And I am very aware that the perspective I bring on this issue um, is you know, different for some people and challenging for others, and I just enjoy the opportunity to uh, do that. Yesterday, I tried to make the case that the kingdom of God, the reign of God, isn't simply sort of a grab bag of all the nice things we like about life, all the things that we think are good and noble and true. Uh, it's not that. We can't just dump all of our political ideals and nationalistic ideals and cultural ideals into this bag and call that the kingdom of God. We might like to do that because a central part of our fallen nature is to kind of reign over our own kingdom rather than to submit to the reign of God. But in fact, as I argued yesterday, the Bible has a very specific, very focused, almost myopic understanding of the reign of God. And it is incarnated in the person of Jesus Christ, and it always looks like Jesus Christ. And all that he did, his teachings, his ministry, his life, his death, his resurrection, he put on display the beauty of God's character, the beauty of what it looks like when God reigns in a life. And in the process of doing that, he revolted against everything in the culture and everything in the spiritual realm that pushed back on that, that disagreed with that, that was inconsistent with the reign of God. His life was a life of political, social, and spiritual warfare. He bore witness to the beauty of God, and those who had eyes to see could see it. And for others, it was just scandalous. Those steeped in their religious traditions, it was just scandalous. Our call, I said yesterday, is to be uh, 
followers of Jesus, to imitate, mimetai in Greek, mimic Jesus Christ, to participate in his uh, establishing and spreading of the kingdom. Our call is to uh, follow Jesus' example in all things and by the power of the Spirit 24-7 to put on display the same God he put on display, to manifest the same reign that he manifested, to do all that he did, to live a life that is patterned after and orientated around him, to live like Jesus and love like Jesus and serve like Jesus and sacrifice like Jesus. That is the kingdom of God. And to be that, I suggested yesterday, is to be a bearer of good news. Uh, Being an evangelist isn't a secondary call or a secondary thing in the kingdom. Rather, it's, it's simply part of what it means to be a kingdom person. It's to proclaim with our life and with our words the reign of God. There's a new way of living, and it's living under the beauty of God's reign. And this is... <clears throat> Good news to all who have a heart and are open to being under the reign of God. But of course it will, just as it did with Jesus, it will and it should put off and even scandalize those who don't have a heart to be under the reign of God. And now I want to ask this question. What is it that keeps us, 21st century Jesus followers, from more effectively displaying that reign? What is it that keeps us from more effectively evangelizing our culture? Which is to say, uh, the, the paradigm that I've set up here, what is it that keeps us from being fully the kingdom of God? What keeps us from being the cruciform revolution, the Jesus-looking revolution uh, that he has called us and empowered us to be? In John thirteen thirty five, Jesus says, and this is as basic as it gets, he says, this is how they'll know you that you're my disciples, by your love. And then in John 17, there's that marvelous prayer where Jesus prays, starting with verse 20, Father, I pray that they may be one, even as we are one, that they would embody the, the life of the triune God, that their oneness would reflect our oneness. And then he says two times in the span of six verses, so that the world will know that you've sent me so that the world will know that you've sent me. Our love, I take it, is to be the proof that Jesus Christ is sent from God. Jesus is God's Messiah, and the reign of God has been unleashed into this world. God wired it into his strategy for taking the world back to himself, that the world is to see something of the reality of the triune God, the character of God, and the reign of God, in our midst by the way we love one another and the way we love the world. God, it seems to me, has leveraged everything on his people loving like this. And remember, the Bible defines love by pointing us to Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.16. Here's what we know love is. Jesus Christ. He loved us and gave his life for us. That's what we're supposed to do and give our life for one another. And God has leveraged everything, it seems to me, on His people being willing willing to live in that mode, living out that radical love. And so as I showed yesterday, Ephesians 5, Paul says, Be imitators of God. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us. That's what it means to imitate God. That is to be our heartbeat. That's the center of the center. That's our central call. Uh, When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? He says in Matthew 22, uh, it's to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, if you do that, you will fulfill the whole law. Everything hangs on this, he says. Paul says the same thing several times. James and Peter also uh, teach that. Love fulfills everything. Everything hangs on this. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, Paul says, Let everything you do be done in love, that love that looks like Jesus. Don't ever do anything unless it's motivated by the love of Christ, unless it's uh, for the purpose of furthering the love of Christ. I tell people sometimes, if you're ever in a theological debate or something and winning becomes more important than loving, do the kingdom a favor and shut up. Because if you can't do it in love, you may win the debate, but it's of no kingdom value whatsoever. In Galatians 5, Paul has the audacity to say that the only thing that matters 
is faith being energized by love, the only thing that matters. And then as I mentioned yesterday in 1 Corinthians 13, he says you can understand all mysteries and have all knowledge and do great miracles and speak in tongues and all the rest, but if it's not motivated by Christ-like love, done for the purpose of furthering Christ-like love, then it may be impressive, it may be good, but it's not the kingdom. So it may be that if we're not attracting people to the beautiful reign of God, it might suggest it's because we're not loving each other and the world the way Christ loves. Given the way God seems to have structured this, if, if they're not, as we heard in the chapel this morning, if they're not beating down our doors to you know, kind of be a part of this uh, reign, it might be because we're in fact, and we have to be honest about this, we're not loving the way Christ has loved us. We're not loving each other, not loving the world. And in fact, all the evidence suggests just this. There's a book out there, maybe some of you have read it, called Unchristian. I really recommend reading this book. It just does surveys of the perceptions that non-believers have of Christians. And I'll give you a short synopsis. Uh, we're known for a lot of things, <clears throat> but our radical willingness to humbly and non-judgmentally love and serve others isn't in the top 100. <laughs> <laughs> and see, that's, that, that really is just scandalous. Jesus attracted people by the scandalous way he loved. I mean, tax collectors and prostitutes wanted to hang out with him. He was the one sinless person in history, and yet his holiness didn't put off the sinners. It attracted the sinners. The Pharisees' holiness put off the sinners. They had a different kind of religious holiness, but the holiness of Jesus attracted the worst of sinners. And so we got to ask the question, are we... How are we viewed by the tax collectors and prostitutes of our day? Do they steer clear of us the way they did the Pharisees in the first century? Or are they beating down our doors the way they did with Jesus in the first century? If the answer is the former, we have got to assess ourselves and ask, maybe it's because there's more of a spirit of Phariseeism in our midst than the spirit of the loving Christ. We've got to shoot honest on this one because everything hangs on this. Now, why is this? Why do we have such a blockage when it comes to loving uh, like Christ loves and manifesting uh, the holistic reign of God the way Jesus did? I think on this question, we've got to really be willing to dig down and get beneath the surface. Because if we don't do that, we might think that it's just a matter of trying a little bit harder. Maybe if we give a few more pep talks on, on how we need to love our neighbor, well, that will really do it. But in fact, I think we give quite a few pep talks on this, and it doesn't really do it. It doesn't bring about fundamental change. We're putting Band-Aid on a cancer. And so I want to diagnose at least one aspect of what I think the cancer is. In a nutshell, it's this. I believe that we have, at a deep fundamental level, been co-opted by the life and the culture of the empire. We've been co-opted by the life and the culture of the empire. And this, in fact, is a tradition that goes back a long, long way. In the early church, it's really interesting, for the first three centuries, they weren't perfect. There's never been a perfect church. They did some silly stuff, some stupid... I mean, you know, they had some, some nonsense going on. Of course, they're humans. But there was, in general, a sort of cruciform character to this movement. This band of people who were living in often hostile environments... Uh, they looked a lot like Jesus. The way they treated each other and the way they served the world it looked a lot like a corporate version of Jesus. And in manifesting the reign of God, they revolted against certain aspects of their culture. It's interesting that Justin and Origen, two of the early fathers, they point to, in dialogue with skeptics, they point to the nature of the kingdom community as proof that what they're teaching is true. Celsus, for example, says to Origen, you know, if Jesus was the Messiah, then, then why isn't the world all a better place? Where's all this love that you're talking about? And Origen simply says, well, come and, and, and check out our community. Because the way we treat one another and the way we love and serve is evidence, it's proof that Jesus is for real. Thereby fulfilling John 13 and, and uh, John 17, Jesus' prayer in John 17. They pointed to the community as the evidence that the reign of God was real. The kingdom has come. They manifested the beauty of God's reign, and they revolted against aspects of their culture 
which were not in sync with that reign. So, for example, they would not pledge allegiance to the emperor by lighting incense before a statue, and for that many of them gave their lives. They wouldn't participate in many of the forms of entertainment, the barbaric, violent, lewd forms of entertainment in the Roman Empire. Uh, they refused to participate in the violence of the empire. Uh, on the whole, they would not participate in the military. Uh, they would frequently rescue kids that were abandoned by fathers, as was the legal right of, of Roman citizen fathers. They'd go out there and rescue that kid, the, those kids. And for that, they were accused of undermining family values in the ancient world. Uh, they came against sickness in the, with the power of God, and they came against spiritual oppression with the power of God. The church grew largely by how they demonstrated their care for and ability to address sickness and oppression and things like that. The way that their lives contrasted with the empire was their witness. They preached with their lives, and they preached with their death, because frequently they were put to death. And the way that they died was often so different from what people expected, as usually happens when people are put to death, they'd be praying for their enemies and blessing them, that that was a witness, and many people came to Christ just watching these folks getting crucified, fed to lions, and, and whatnot. That's when the term for witness became synonymous with giving your life, martyr. By their life and by their death, they bore witness to this unique, different way of doing life under the reign of God. And the church grew spectacularly. Uh, in, in, in a hostile environment, it's just, it, it really is, a, uh, I think, a supernatural thing that the church grew like this in, in this kind of environment. Well, as many of you know, that began to change rather quickly around the 4th century. The Emperor Constantine, before going to, uh, in an important battle against a rival emperor, allegedly, according to Eusebius, had a vision. And the vision told him to uh, put the first two letters of Christ on, his, on the shields of his soldiers and march in under the banner of Christ, and, and Christ would give him the victory. And so Constantine did this, and he won the battle quite spectacularly, and so became convinced that, uh, that Christ was at least a god, uh, and became favorable towards the Christians. It was the first time Christ was ever associated with violence, and sadly it was far from the last time. Um, and so he became favorable towards the Romans, and, or, or towards, towards the Christians. Um, it's interesting that Jesus... When he was offered all the authority of the kingdoms of the world, he regarded it as a temptation of Satan in Luke 4. But now when you see, when Constantine begins to favor the Christians and build their temples and get involved in their theological discussions and give them unique privileges, and finally when Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire uh, several decades later, now people like Eusebius and St. Augustine don't see it as a temptation of the devil. They see it as a blessing from God. Augustine says, well, if God has given us the sword, we have a responsibility to use it in his honor. And so now the crucified way of doing life, the cruciform revolution, begins to be marginalized. We have the power of the sword, and now the church becomes the church militant and triumphant. It's at this point where church people begin to, Christians begin to rely on the power of the sword rather than the power of the cross. I begin to trust in our ability to control people's behavior rather than love them and serve them into the kingdom. The church increasingly begins to look like a religious version of Caesar rather than the crucified Christ. And the church begins to embrace now aspects of the culture that it previously used to revolt against because now it's deemed that the culture has become Christian. We are victorious here. We began losing the centrality of that servant self-sacrificial love that is at the heart of the kingdom. And so before too long, when Christians come into power, they begin to persecute the pagans, and they do it in the name of the one who taught us to persecute, to bless those who persecute us. Uh, instead of loving our enemies, we begin to put them to death. Uh, instead of doing good to those who are against us, turning the other cheek, we sometimes cut off their head. And there's a long, sad tradition about that throughout church history, as I'm sure you all know. Now, what we need to know in this cultural context is that America was conquered with that Constantinian mindset. 
Uh, it, we, you know, it's, it's par for the course that nations are conquered under some god or other. There's, every nation has its national gods, its tribal gods, its warring gods, and, and they conquer in those names and, and ask for the favor of the gods to give them victory. And that's how America was conquered. The only unique thing, perhaps, is that it was done under the banner of Jehovah uh, and, and in Jesus' name. Our founding fathers didn't speak this way, but preachers almost from the start did. This is a Christian nation. We are victorious. It was very Constantinian. Uh, we have conquered in Jesus' name. This is a holy nation set on a hill. It's the light of the world, holy city, and we still sometimes hear that kind of lingo. It's evidenced by the fact that throughout most of our history, to be a missionary meant you go someplace else. We send missionaries. As though America no longer needed missionaries, as though this was not itself a mission field. Why? Well, because the assumption is we've conquered, and so this is a Christian nation. Now, even though we're in a post-Christian age, everyone grants that, this Constantinian attitude, I submit to you, still remains, and it undermines so much of the kingdom. We're still largely, according to the paradigm of Constantine, still largely co-opted by the culture of the empire because we're conditioned not to notice the aspects of the empire that we're called to resist. Why? Because there still is this echo of this mindset that the empire has been established for Christ. And so it's not surprising when we read from Barna's studies and a number of other places that as a matter of fact there's very little difference between the way that that uh, professing Christians live and the way that non-Christians live. In terms of our core values and in terms of our lifestyle, there's very little difference, which is what you'd expect given this Constantinian mindset and the tyranny that it has. Which means the only thing that really is different between Christians and non-Christians is how we answer questions when a pollster calls us. We have a different set of opinions about Jesus, perhaps, maybe the Bible, maybe some political stuff. But that's what really sets us apart. Our lives don't. And so now, in this paradigm, evangelism becomes reduced to convincing people of your opinions. Which, to the non-Christian, comes across as convincing people that we're right. And that's what, means, what it means to be an evangelist. And even that gets co-opted by the culture. Uh, you know, what, what happens is, is in, in this consumeristic culture, the way that you convince somebody of something is by marketing. And so what happens, and this is especially prevalent in the last four or five decades, is we be, we, the church becomes a marketer of Jesus. And just like the advertising agencies do, we figure out who is our target audience, how do we market to this target audience, how do we attract this target audience, and how do we sell Jesus to this target audience, because evangelism means convincing them that uh, our views of Jesus and the Bible and the rest are right. Potential church attendees become consumers, and the consumer is always right. And so we package up Jesus in just the right way and we try to give it a nice spin and how Jesus can improve your life and, and make your life better and how you can have your best life now. And, and all the things that Western people want to hear, we try to associate that with Jesus and, and it doesn't require any kind of change in our life. Jesus becomes one more addendum to our already spectacularly nice lives that are four times the global average. Well, you can have all that and Jesus to boot. We're selling Jesus. And salvation, the salvation message, when people are trained to think like consumers, the salvation message becomes a good deal. You say this prayer, and, and now you, you get assurance that you're not going to go to hell just in case there is a hell. And, and, um, and that becomes salvation. It's, it's, it's for a free deal, uh, for this prayer, saying the sinner's prayer, or whatever the tradition might require. Now you have your fire insurance. So they say their prayer go out the door more secure about that than they were before, but nothing really changes. And in fact, if you got the right personality and the right team and the right musicians and whatever, uh, and you're really clever, you can build a, a big churches like that. But it leaves people entrapped in their self-centeredness. The consumer mindset is, from a kingdom perspective, anti-Christ. It's what we need to be freed from. But instead, the church caters to it in Jesus' name. Aspects of the empire that we should be revolting against, we embrace, as has always been the Constantinian tradition, 
and we now just do it in Jesus' name. And so the revolutionary, countercultural, self-sacrificial love of Christ is largely absent from our churches. People aren't being challenged to move into a different kind of life. Jesus becomes a footnote to what they've already got rather than a new center around which their life is orientated. Since we're called to imitate Jesus and we're doing a little talk here on evangelism, it might be good to ask, how did Jesus do evangelism? And the way he did evangelism, as I mentioned yesterday, was in large part just by being who he was, by living in the, under the reign of God and manifesting the love and the power of God and serving people and sacrificing people and revolting against all the structures of society that aren't in line with that reign. But it's interesting when people came up to him and said, can I be your disciple? Jesus hardly gave it a nice spin. Uh, it says things like, let the dead bury the dead. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back isn't worthy to be called my disciple. Uh, are you willing to pick up your cross and follow me? Count the cost. No one goes to war or starts to build a tower unless you first assess whether you're capable of this. Have you considered what this means? Take up your cross. And when he says take up your cross, he's not referring to a nice little pretty chain around someone's neck. He, he, they know what a cross is. It's, a, it's that excruciating, barbaric form of torturous death. And Jesus is saying to follow me is going to mean you're gonna, you'll die to yourself. He didn't sell the rightness of his opinions. He loved and served and confronted people as a way of inviting them into a different way of life. He put all the cards on the table. Yes, if you will die to yourself and follow me, there is, this is the best way to live. This is a life that you were created for. To have a relationship with God is to be tapped into the source of all peace and the source of all joy. Uh, and and uh, this is the way you were meant to, to, to live. The world, it will give you things the world could never give you. But to get there, you've got to die. Surrender your life, your self-centered way of life, and now join this way of doing life as a follower of Jesus. I, I believe we need to, we desperately need to recover the Jesus-centered, counter-cultural, self-sacrificial life of the kingdom. To put the loving reign of God on display while revolting against everything in the culture that is contrary to that loving reign. And to invite people not just to share our opinions, but to invite them in on a new way of life that we ourselves, by the grace of God, are inching forward on. In an empire that is characterized by self-centeredness, how we need a people who, who manifest God's cruciform love. And in a culture uh, characterized by greed, God is calling us to be a people who manifest the outrageous generosity of the kingdom of God. In a culture that is characterized by consumerism, God's calling us to be a people who live simply and swim upstream in the culture of perpetual wants and got to get more and got to have this and that. And in a culture, in an empire, where everyone's conditioned to grasp after power in order to enforce their, of course, correct and righteous will on others, how we need a people, and God's calling us to be a people, who have their foremost trust in the humility of the cross, the Christ way of changing the world by serving others. And in an empire that still to this day is torn apart along race, gender, and class lines, God's calling us to be a people who manifest what it is to be free of those sorts of diabolical uh, walls set up between people and to manifest the one new humanity that Jesus died for. In, a, in an empire that is steeped in its own nationalism, how God needs and how we are called to be a people who uh, testify in our life that we're citizens of a different country before we're citizens of any country here and now, and that we have one Lord and his name is Jesus Christ. In a culture steeped in violence, God's calling us to be a people uh, who are characterized by outrageous peace and who are peacemakers. In a culture and an empire characterized by sexual immorality, where sex is used for consumeristic purposes, God's calling us to be a people who put on display the beauty of honoring God with our bodies. In a culture that doesn't look at all like Jesus, God's calling us and empowering us by his grace to be a people who do look like Jesus, or at least who are moving in that direction, and who by our life and by our word, 
proclaim that the kingdom has come. Proclaim what God has done for us. And we, put, uh, we do that by putting on display what God is doing in us and through us. We put on display his love for us by how we love him, how we love one another, and how we love the world. It's a call to live life the way life was meant to be lived, but it's a call to radical discipleship. And if we're doing it right, those who have ears to hear will, will gravitate towards it. They'll be hungry for it. And those who don't will be put off by it. And that's the way it ought to be. I found that the clearer I get on the kingdom and the cost of discipleship and the unique beauty of the kingdom, the smaller my church gets. <laughs> Aren't I a good candidate for a talk on evangelism here? <laughs> my board tells me I should go on the road with this and, and hold church shrinkage seminars. Uh, we have enough church growth seminars. Let's have... But see, I think that's okay, that because we're not called to have impressive congregations. We're not called to, to be pragmatic first and foremost. We're called to be faithful. And um, the kingdom is a mustard seed kingdom. But see, the beauty of this different way of doing life, it pulls those who are hungry for it and who have ears to hear and eyes to see. At the same time, I'll say that my assessment of the culture here and now is this. It seems to me that the movements, the kingdom movements that have the most life and are really beginning to impact <clears throat> uh, their neighborhoods the most are these streams of Christianity that are doing this, living this way. The urban monastic movement, for example, some of the house church movements, uh, some of the emergent church uh, movements, uh, they're living out this kind of radical community. And um, uh, that is hitting a chord, I think, because people are hungry for that. They're hungry to see the reality of the triune God reigning in the midst of a people. And I suspect that the sales pitch of getting nothing or getting everything for nothing is growing a little bit old. Uh, in closing, I'm, I'm just going to give a few little practical things here that I, I think will help move in this direction. How do we make this paradigm shift and begin to move in this direction of looking like a community that manifests the kingdom? Uh, several things here. One is I believe we need, desperately need, bold leaders who teach and preach this vision of the kingdom over and over and over again. The kingdom looks like Jesus. It's all about love centered on self-sacrificial love. It always looks like Jesus, like, like Jesus getting crucified for the very people who crucified him. It always has a cruciform character to it. How we need visionary leaders and teachers who will challenge the status quo and make people uncomfortable in the pews and, and, and help them wake up to the many ways that our lives have been co-opted by the life and the culture of the empire and to begin to, out of the grace of God, have the power to stand up against that and look different. Secondly, I think we need repentance and prayer uh, in, a, in a desperate way. Uh, I think the church today is in quicksand and we cannot pull ourselves up uh, Christianity isn't a try harder sort of things where if we just buck it up and, and use our willpower, we'll be able to change this around. Uh, I don't think of that for a moment. We are always radically dependent on God. And what needs is for us to wake up to the ways we've been co opted, repent of that, which just means to turn from it, and then be on our faces individually and corporately asking God to change our hearts, to hunger and thirst after righteousness uh, that the world cannot give, and to live in a different way. Third, I think we need to, as I mentioned yesterday, recover the practice of the spiritual disciplines. Fasting, prayer, solitude, uh, hospitality, and all the other disciplines that have been practiced throughout history. We've largely lost that today. And some fear that if we go back to that, it's sort of a works righteousness. But there's nothing works about it. We're not earning any points by doing the spiritual disciplines. But the spiritual disciplines are all designed just to position us in a way where we're more open and receptive to the life of God flowing into us that the life of God may flow out of us. The spiritual disciplines are there to help us be conformed to the image of Christ. And I believe that we need to recover those. We need, I, I believe, uh, very important here, to recover what Alan Hirsch calls communitas. Not just community, which is kind of a fellowship of people getting together who like each other, but communitas, which is community with a purpose, with a mission. The Christian faith was never meant to be lived solo. I don't think it can ever be effectively lived in a solo mode. 
We can't live in the revolutionary kind of love and can't swim upstream in the culture in a significant way if we're trying to do it alone. In the Bible, of the, the book of Acts, the, the churches always met in each other's houses. They didn't have separate buildings. They met in houses. They broke bread daily, it says. They prayed. They studied the word daily. They did ministry with one another. They were an intimate group of people in an in a often hostile environment. And I believe to the core of my being that that, that is the primary unit of the Christian faith. It's not a large group that gathers once a week on the weekend, but it's rather those you share life with. Uh, there's 57 one another's in the New Testament to speak the truth to one another, love one another, encourage one another, confront one another. And all of those only are appropriate in a context where you know the other person and you care about the other person and they know that and you're doing life together. I think we all need to have people involved in our life who know us, who can detect when we're starting to go astray or starting to be co-opted by the culture, and who love us enough to confront that. That's how we mature, is when there's people, mentors in our life, who can challenge us. I am, even though I act like an extrovert, I'm actually, I test out as a radical introvert. Uh, I, I have a, a limited capacity to be around people for sustained periods of time. My wife used to have to drag me places uh, to have friends. I'm much more comfortable with a book than I am getting with a social gathering. But over the years, thank God for my wife, I have learned how crucial this is. I don't know how I would do life without my small group. Uh, for 10 years or so, and it changes, people come and people go, but there's a core of us who just do life together. We moved into the city several years ago from the suburb. We're living on the same block. We're doing ministry together. At least once or twice a week we get together, we break bread, we pray together. Sometimes we just go out and party. Sometimes we go out and serve the neighborhood in, in different ways. But this is my church. I pastor an event, but this is my church. And this is how I grow and this is how I matured. As people sometimes will confront me saying, Greg, what is up with this? I believe this is the primary unit of evangelism. As we manifest a oneness, a love, by the way we do life. And Jesus says that's how the world will know that he has been sent by the Father. And the final thing I'll say very briefly is this. We need to get out of our church buildings. Um, it is really a Constantinian paradigm that church is a place that you go to. As the church is a building, I, in fact, think it was influenced by a pagan mindset where the God resides in a temple. And so it was at that point where Constantine thought, well, gosh, if Christ is the true God, we have to build temples for him. And, and the church became associated with a building. And what it means to do church is primarily you get together in that building and you sing some nice songs and you hear a sermon. Now, I'm all for, I'm not against big buildings. I got one. And I'm not against big gatherings. I got some. And, and I'm not against good music. We got some. And I'm not against good sermons. Once in a while, we have one. <laughs> Not frequently, but once in a while. So I'm not, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. Even in the early church, they met in Solomon's court, you know, which was big enough to encompass all the Christians of the city. But the primary unit wasn't that. Because biblically speaking, the church is not a building. It's a people. And never in the Bible are we encouraged to invite, do evangelism by inviting people to a building, which we call church. Hey, want to come to church? There's no precedent for that. Rather, what you do is you are the church and therefore you bring the church to the people. You don't bring the people to the church. You bring the church to the people and we are the church. And so we're called to go out and bring the kingdom to people. Be the kingdom in the midst of people. Uh, Jesus didn't just set up shop in one place and say, Hey everyone, if you want the salvation message, come here. He was always roaming around. Once in a while he'd stay put for a little while. But on the whole, he was roaming around, bringing the kingdom to people. And that is our call, to get out of our church buildings. It's great to come together and, and get, get fueled up and hear a message and, and study and, and, and worship God. That's fine. But all of that, I submit to you, is worthless if it doesn't translate into what goes on outside of that building. That is where church begins. That is where the kingdom is to be manifested. And so to have people involved in communitas, in groups, and to see that they're not there primarily to just like one another and, 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 and have fun, though hopefully that happens, but they're there with a mission, with a purpose, and it's to seek first the kingdom of God. And to have these 
these, these, these groups, these house churches or small groups, whatever you want to call them, going out and serving the community, serving in the homeless shelters, uh, volunteering at various ministries, uh, supporting uh, homes that are, are uh, being foreclosed on, volunteering in the inner city schools, Maybe having a ministry, as some folks in our church are now doing, a, a ministry to take the gospel into the bars. We've got a kicking band, and we're going to put a Christian band in there and get Christians to go there and just build relationships. So you can't be evangelism without relationships where you get to know people and have fun with people. And Jesus was always partying with people. Well, let, let's train Christians to go out and party with people and, and throw the best parties in town and build relationships so that now they have a chance to begin to see a life that's a little bit different. Bold leaders call for repentance, recover the spiritual disciplines, get people into communitas, and get out into the streets, out of our churches, to spread the good news by how we live, that's our, our sermon, and also by what we say as a commentary on how we live. That, I think, is evangelism uh, from a kingdom perspective, advancing the cruciform revolution. Thank you. I'm going to take some questions. We need a microphone. You'll take questions, and there's a rack of questions on the students to ask questions. Uh, is there a microphone out there? Something we, we've had issues with that microphone, this whole thing. The, the, the mystery of the disappearing microphone. Here, here it comes. Here it comes. Who's got questions? Okay, let me get to you. With some of what you said, it could be perhaps interpreted that you would advocate for a Christian subculture or perhaps a version of asceticism. So what would you say in response to that and how would you shape what you said as a whole towards commentary on that side? Oh, very, very good question. Thanks for asking that. I definitely... Uh, believe that uh, embodied in what I just said is that the, uh, the church is to be a subculture. Uh, if there's a group of people who are refusing to go along with the norms of the empire, it will form a separate subculture. Now, the, the trick is, and I've been talking to the Mennonites a lot about this the last year, something that God sort of opened up. The trick is to be a subculture that isn't living in perpetual anger at the dominant culture, uh, that isn't isolating itself from the dominant culture, that doesn't get like a Masada complex about the dominant culture, that doesn't live in the paranoia of being polluted by the dominant culture, uh, but rather is there to serve the dominant culture while refusing to go along with some of the norms. It is, I think, as, as John uh, Howard Yoder said, it, to be a contrast society. I really think that's the goal there. Um, when, when you use the word asceticism, uh, I'm really hesitant to say yes or no to that because a lot depends on what you mean by asceticism. I, I do believe in the spiritual uh, disciplines of self-denial, fasting once in a while and things like that, but I'm completely opposed because I think it's very unbiblical wh where that can go sometimes, where you, know, you have some of the desert fathers doing some pretty outrageous things because they're looking at the body or the physicality as being bad and, and trying to you know, the, see the body as the problem and things. I, so I want to avoid all of that. But to have disciplines, a community of people who, involve, who are involved in the spiritual disciplines, because we're saying, look, we want to be the bride who makes herself ready. And we want to help one another grow in the kingdom. And to be subversives in this culture. And not buy into all those sorts of things. Uh, we also have to protect, protect against legalism. That's always a problem here, where people start to come up with rules. And, and we have to get, have an appropriate sense of ambiguity that people are going to see things differently. And we're all in, in process. But having said all that, yes, I think the heart of the kingdom is to be a, uh, a contrast society, a subculture. Thank you for that question. Other questions? Well, <laughs> time is running short, so let's... <laughs> I often share things that are half-formulated. <laughs> 
You said something like, um, maybe people have had enough of being offered everything for nothing. And I'm working on that. Um, some would say that they haven't been offered anything for nothing because there are so many strings attached, subtle strings down underneath the surface, and that if we were really to offer them everything for nothing, it could be a revolution, an explosion. Um, can you run with that? Say, oh, I, I, well, I they, see, okay, yes. There's where I'm struggling here. Yeah, you know, it, part of what, this kind of goes maybe to something uh, that Bonhoeffer said when he says, you know, grace is free, but it's not cheap. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. When, when I referred to uh, the, the idea that, that people are, are, are getting tired of that old sales pitch, something for nothing, what I'm specifically having in mind, and this probably is coming out of my context that I operate in, maybe more than where most folks here are, are this, this morning, but I'm talking about the, the, the idea that you give a sermon and you have people raise their hands. It's the Southern Baptist evangelism kind of thing. I used to do that. Uh, we used to have every year hundreds of people you know, commit to Christ. And you know, they come forward and we give them a card and, and all that stuff. And that really gets a cheer and excitement in the crowd. And you know, we had 700 people saved this year. But after doing that for about 10 years, I really began to see a pattern that after 10 years, there's hardly anything to show for that. And the few cases that I really knew well, I actually thought I did more harm than good. Because in this culture, people hear that as, as consumers, and what they hear is, okay, so nothing has to change. If I say this prayer, somehow magically I have my fire insurance, and they think that's the real Christianity, and in some ways I've just blocked them from the real thing. And so now I talk about you know, making a pledge, like a marriage vow, to get started on a kingdom walk, but this is just the beginning, not the end. So that's what I have in mind there. On the other hand, we have to always be driving home the foundation of the kingdom is that we don't earn this. You know, the changes we make in our life are not like somehow meriting anything. It's all in response to what God has already done for us. Here's what love is, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And so, yes, you put out this absolutely free grace that's out there, no qualifications. The way that we can receive that is by dying to our way of getting life that has nothing to do with that, which is that self-oriented way. That's how I... Well, go ahead. He, he's formulating it more. <laughs> but the second you say, but the way we get to that is by dying and so forth and so on, suddenly you are back, you are, you are uh, conditioning it all over again. Somehow we have been unable to give it give it completely away in a, in a free way that, uh, pe that impacts on people. Somehow the, all they can hear is the qualifications, maybe. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, when, when you talk about the, the qualifications, I hear where you're coming from, but, it, but when you say all you have to do is die, I still hear a qualification coming out of that. Yeah. So somehow the gift has to be given so cleanly. Sure. Well, maybe we have different theologies of this. You know, that's always possible. Um, but as I see it, the, the, you know, Jesus, I think, did that. Uh, are you willing to die? Are you willing to pick up your cross? And that's not a matter of earning it or anything. It doesn't, I don't see that as qualifying the free gift at all. It's very much like, you know, uh, my wife loved me, I think, unconditionally, but I still had to say, I do. I, you have to receive that. And realize that in saying, I do, it's in the nature of love. It's good for me. Part of what this I do means is my life's going to radically change. Uh, far more than you ever dreamed when you said I do. That's <laughs> how it goes. But so it, it's, it, it's an I do that's, that is to receive the life and the love, realizing that's going to have massive implications. And our job is to let that go and to let the implications flush itself out. Dr. Boyd, thank you again for this lecture today. Um, connecting with what Mark, Mark had to say in your conversation about us, you know, the, the qualifications, us needing to die, would you agree with, and maybe this is where we theologically might disagree, but that it's God that kills us. And it's God who has changed our hearts and minds and will make us live that will make yeah. us be the kingdom sure okay okay uh, there is of course as you probably know uh, 
a very hot Pandora's box that we are about to open as I answer this question. <laughs> you know, because, but, but we can't go review all of that. Um, I mean, there's, there's two extremes, and then, I, and then I'll show you kind of how, where I'm in the middle. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, some you know, sort of decision theologies where you know, God really doesn't do anything except in response to what you do. So you have to, out of what, your own intellect or virtuousness or whatever, you make a choice and God says, oh good, and then he responds and gives it to you. So that's, I think, one extreme. The other extreme is that the human self, or the will, plays no autonomous role, uh, but rather uh, God irrevocably, irresistibly turns the heart and uh, orientates it towards God. Uh, and that then leads to certain conclusions like, well, then God must just be picking and choosing who he's going to ir irresistibly turn and leaving others to, you know, and that's the, kind of the Calvinist route. Uh, where I'm at, and we could talk exegetically about this till the cows come home, but um, it, it's that I, I, I think that the, the work of the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for a heart to be turned. But I don't think it's sufficient. I think there is a yielding that we have to do. Uh, God massages. I could not believe unless it was by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. I, I'm convinced of that. Uh, I really do think we're dead in our sins. But I do, I, where I back off of is the irresistible part. I, I think we can quench. The mystery is that we, that we still continue to quench him, uh, despite all that he does to turn us around towards him. But when we are turned, we can't take any credit for it. It's all to the glory of God. Yes? Um, at the end of your lecture, you gave us some, you know, practices in which we are uh, shaped um, in a kingdom sort of way, a cruciform sort of way. Um, I'm wondering if you could say more about how you see the kingdom related to um, the other practices that we're involved in that construct our identity um, inevitably. Um, we are a part of an economy. Um, you're an American citizen. I'm an American citizen. Um, we participate in a democracy. I mean, there's all kinds of other practices that are just inevitably a part of, of, of our identity. I'm wondering how you see that related to the kingdom or not. Um, and then um, how that would maybe be related to the way in which you tell the, the story of, of Jesus and Jesus' um, inauguration of the kingdom. And yet as, as a, a Jewish male, he was inevitably um, engaged in all kinds of other practices uh, too. I don't know if that, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. Well, young men, free trade. And, and, but I wouldn't have known that. I need a community to help me walk this out. Now, I can't create a law that says no one's a real Christian if they drink Folgers. But I, I, but I do want to create a mindset. Well, see, there's always a temptation to do that when people get passionate about it. You look at what's being done in industrial farms, and man, it's like, is that good stewardship of animals? Uh, you know, and the impulse would want to, for me would want to be like, let's create a law that Christians should never buy from industrial farms. But we got to give space to be in process and growing. And so I'm much more comfortable talking about uh, principles, the principles of the kingdom, always orientated around looking like, living like, serving like, sacrificing like Jesus, and to have principles to live by while we leave the applications to those mostly uh, to the communitas. Um, and, and we respect each other's differences. I know folks who uh, feel like because of their call to the kingdom, they don't want to participate in the democracy. I, I'll, I'll respect them for that. Maybe I'll even learn if I talk to them. Uh, but I, they don't have the right to impose that on me or vice versa. So there's a lot of ambiguity in, in, in involved in this. I'll say one final thing. I think we're probably getting close to the end. But that's that, you know, to be in the world and not of the world is to recognize... That there is no, I, 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 try to hear me right on this, I, I probably shouldn't even mention it without having the time to qualify it, but I don't think there is a sinless place to stand. I, th th this is the solidarity of original sin, as I see it. Everything, every dollar in my wallet, or I should say both dollars in my wallet, are, <laughs> I'm sure is tainted somewhere along the line. It's all dirty money. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, work in a bank, and but now you're co-opting with some very unjust, you know, loaning, for example, uh, policies. And, you know, th there really is no uh, pure and pristine place to stand, I don't think. And so whatever we do in the ambiguity of this world, while we strive to live out the kingdom, I think confession is always uh, a, uh, uh, to be part of our life. Uh, Lord, I, I, I'm a sinner. Uh, wake me up to what you want me to be moving out of. Uh, but um, as part of this solidarity with this fallen humanity, I invariably sin. And so we are always 
uh, day in and day out, uh, uh, needing of and recipients of God's outrageous grace. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you so very, very much, Greg. It's just been a pleasure to I have you. And uh, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a thing at, on Saturday, I guess it is. Yeah, yeah. Pick up a little bit of Mennonite theology.